evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kate Moss. I'm a novelist and a playwright, and as some of you know, the biographer of Chichester Festival Theatre. And it's my enormous pleasure to welcome everybody back for another season. Yes, uh, yes exactly, another season. Um, now, of course, that is a source of great joy for us all, but it's also a very sad moment on the one hand because it's Jonathan and Alan's last season, but that's why we're going to make it the best season to send them off in that wonderful way and we're going to have a new wonderful team in. And so this year, um, I'm going to be doing all the pre and all the post performance uh, talks as well, um, which is a disaster because, as most of you know, I write early and I go to bed about nine, <laughs> so they'll be happening at a different time. Um, but this evening, we're here to celebrate the opening of the season and the first show of the season, which opens tomorrow, which is Travels with My Aunt. Um, and the wonderful director, Christopher Luscombe, is here. Uh, now, some of you will remember him from a small family business, maybe, or Beverly Carlton and the man who came for dinner. He was Noel Coward, really. Yes. He was brilliant. Um, but it's wonderful to have you here as a director. Um, Chris's uh, CV is too long to read out, so you must all buy a programme <laughs> and read it there. Um, but as well, of course, as doing Travels with My Aunt, opening the season for Jonathan and Alan, he will also be closing the season uh, with Love's Labour's Lost and Much Ado About Nothing, his RSC production. Um, of course, we also should give him a round of applause for Nell Gwynn, which I think just has finished, but the... Uh, uh, about one more to week. finish. One, one more week. week, but the Olivier Award winning. Oh, yes. Yes, Thank so you. that is fantastic. Yes, there we are. Thank you. Right, and enough gush. Enough gush. Enough gush. Um, Actually, not enough gush. <laughs> I don't think you should encourage me, should he? Really, they've all heard me gush far too much before. Um, one of the things that's wonderful, uh, Chris, is about you being here, back as a director, having been here as an actor, yeah. is that you know the theatres and you know what they're like. Yeah. So can you just say a little bit about how it came to be that you are involved with what is a world premiere of a new British musical? Yes, I'm really thrilled to be doing a new musical because I've done a lot of revivals of shows uh, in my time and I, I don't often get the chance to sort of work on brand new material. Um, it's very important to me, the fact that it's here, because I was not only did I do those couple of shows as an actor, um, just uh, around the turn of the century, actually, it was about the... <laughs> The 19th century, of course. <laughs> uh, but also, I w used to come here regularly as a child to see shows uh, because we used to have family holidays down the coast. Um, and so, we, this was, in a way, this place was my theatrical mm. education. And so it, it means an enormous... I can't tell you what it means to me because I used to hang around at the stage door asking famous people for autographs. And I, I, it was a very, very special place for me. I love Chichester anyway. Um, and I love coming back here, and I'm very thrilled to be doing three productions in, in Jonathan's last season. That, that came as a big surprise. I've, I've always wanted to direct it, but never had the chance. And this musical came around because um, it was, I think, largely because Jonathan came to see my two Shakespeare's at Stratford a year ago, and they were looking for someone to do the musical. And I remember he went to um, George and Anthony, who wrote the piece, wrote the music and the lyrics, and he said, I, I've just saw this, these shows in Stratford. I think the guy who directed it might be a thought. And they said, oh, we know Chris really well because we go back a long way. I've known George and Anthony for about, uh, about 20 years and we've always said we wanted to do a show together. <laughs> I did a show called The Shakespeare Review, which was the first thing I ever directed, actually, which I did at Stratford and then in the West End. And we, it was a collection of comic material about Shakespeare. And um, we commissioned various writers to contribute as well as all the famous Cole Porter, um, Beyond the Fringe, um, those sort of Alan Bennett, whatever, we also commissioned some pieces and we went to Styles and Drew, who were then just making their mark as sort of this very young, dynamic writing duo. And they wrote two hilarious songs for the Shakespeare Review. And we became very good friends, but I didn't ever think that I would end up directing one of their musicals, but I wanted to very much. And in fact, I directed the play of Travels with My Aunt three years ago at the Chocolate Factory in London. And that's, that's a completely different version. It's, it's, there's no, no songs or anything. It's just a play with four actors playing all the different parts. Um, very unusual adaptation, very brilliant adaptation, actually. Um, and so I knew the material very well. And in fact, when this was offered, I had slight misgivings because I felt I'd, I'd sort of covered this piece, really. I'd, I'd experienced it. I'd lived through it three years ago. Um, 
But I said, I, I was a little bit weak, really, and I said, well, can I, can I listen to the songs? Um, and can I read the script? And I must say that when I heard the songs, I thought, I've got to do it. They're, it's very unusual to have a musical written, a brand new musical, which has songs you really want to hum as you leave the theatre. Mm. And this is one of them. And I, I, I just thought it was so clever. I could see what the writers, and I include the book writers in that, the two American book writers, who I thought they'd so cleverly adapted and found a way of making this novel into a, a stage show. And I thought that I really had to do it. I couldn't bear anyone else doing it. I thought, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> so, so that's why I said yes. But when you said you were initially um, slightly reluctant, is that because you need sort of an excitement about discovering something brand new and you felt that having done it in the different adaptation, you just wouldn't have that, that spark. spark that yeah, set absolutely. you off? I... I find it's much easier. As a director, I like it when people come to me with something that I would never have thought of doing. I like doing things which are really varied and not being pinned down um, to do a certain kind of play or a certain kind of musical. And um, I think it, I always feel if when, directors, when producers say to me, we'd like you to do a show for us, what do you want to do? I, I think that's a bit of a killer, really, because I, 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 I would just come up with things that I know I'm comfortable with and feel I know how to do them, and, and it'd probably be a bit boring for me and for the audience. And I think it's really good when people surprise you with stuff, and I just felt this, in a way, was something I wasn't surprised by because it's something that I knew backwards in terms of the, the source material, the Graham Greene novel. Um, had you read... I mean, you read English at Cambridge. Had, yeah. you, had you read the novel um, back in the day? Or? I think it was... I think I'd read other Graham Greene novels, but actually never... I think I'd never read Travels with My Aunt, but I read it when I was offered it three years ago. And um, I, so... And then, of course, read it and reread it and re-reread it um, and sort of lived with those characters, and they became mm. a huge part of my life for a few months. Um, but the challenge of making a musical is so different... Um, that I've never felt in rehearsing this. I've never felt, oh, I'm a bit bored with this now. I, I've absolutely loved it. And I love the collaboration of a musical. Working on a play, you're rather on your own. But with a musical, you've got a mm. musical director and a choreographer, and you've got four living writers <laughs> in the room, which is uh, an experience. And, um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I sort of prefer it when writers are long since dead and yes, buried. Yes. Um, no, no, I'm kidding. That was a joke. That was a joke. Uh, <laughs> Sort of, and uh, and I I I I think it's just a wonderful chance to to um, create a show with a wonderful talented group of people, and and as a director, you're sort of editing all their work, so you're running around making it all come together as a whole, and that's very that's very exciting when you're dealing with such clever people as I am on this show. But one of the things that uh, that many of the people here who come and support these talks and go to everything at the theatre know is that casting is so absolutely critical in a musical. So with a piece like this, particularly when it's a world premiere, is the issue for you as the director and in the collaboration with the entirely alive uh, authors, all of whom are, in, as far as I can see, in the yeah. restaurant, yeah. not in here, Typical. so uh, yeah. <laughs> they're lax writers yeah. Yeah. always... Um, does it start with you saying, I can only conceive of this person doing it, in the case, you know, Patricia Hodge, or do you have in your mind it needs to be a certain sort of actor and then you go out and look for them? Which way round does it come I think casting? it's more a certain sort of actor, um, if I'm honest. I think casting is absolutely crucial and um, I think if you get it wrong, then you, you, you're stymied. But... I think we are very lucky in this country to have such an incredible range and depth of talent. Um, and I tend to find, when I've thought of someone that I really want to play the part, I get a bit obsessed by the idea of them playing it. And then when they, if they say no for whatever reason, um, it, you, you, you have about... Cards. You maybe have about... Yeah, quite. Mm -hmm. And you have about 24 hours of being really in the depths of gloom and doom. But then suddenly you get... a excited about someone else. This was particularly tricky to cast because of the central character, Aunt Augusta, who is um, a, 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 it's a very demanding acting role and singing role, um, and also she has to be a lady of a certain age, and musicals are so taxing physically, mm. and you, know, you need tremendous stamina, really, to play a leading role in a musical. Um, and, and you can't cast her at the age she's actually supposed to be. Well, no, because that's no. I mean, it seventy-five, would, isn't it? Exactly, seventy-five. But you can't cast it too young, or it, or the story doesn't really work. Mm. You have to believe that she is the um, 
I'm not going to give the game. I mean, it must be really... Who has seen it who's so seen far? It? Who's seen it? Right, mm, and there's... who's going in tonight? Oh, quite a lot. Well, I won't give it away. But, yeah. but you know, the, the, for the age, for the story to work, she has to be um, substantially older than, than Henry, the main male role. And he has to be... He's, he's actually taken early retirement from his mm. job, so he's probably not quite 60, but he's getting on that way. I think he's really ideally about 55. Um, so anyway, it's a challenge, but luckily I'd worked with Patricia before and I knew that she was very special and also that we get on brilliantly. We have a, very, we have a lot of fun together and I just love being in the same room as her and um, mm. she, she just ticked all the boxes, really. I just felt that she had all the different qualities I needed but it was a little bit scary because there aren't that many people I could say that of. No. And with some, when it's a, a world premiere, as it is, is that also slight, even more acute? Because actually there will be a sense of the work shifting as you put it together. Yes. And, yeah. and has that happened? Has there been quite a lot of change as you've gone through? Well, actually, um, I came on board about a year ago as the director, but before that, the four writers had been developing it for about two years. So right. they had gone through quite a lot of... Change, chopping and changing and putting in songs, taking out songs. And they did a workshop of the piece um, that Jonathan Church sort of... He, over, he was the overseer of it. He didn't really direct it, but I think he sort of, in a producer kind of way, he, he was mm. around for it. Um, they did a week on it. This was about 18 months ago. And then I came on board about, about a year ago and, and I said that if I was going to do it, I wanted to do another workshop so that I could... Um, do a lot of more tweaking and fiddling around with the script and the mm -hmm. music. And I, I suppose I came to it with quite a definite view of what the piece was, and what I thought it should be, because I wanted it to be true to the spirit of Graham Greene. Um, it, had to be, it had to work as its own entity, but I wanted it to have the feeling of Graham Greene, and I felt that when I was sent it, there were things I wanted to do to nudge it more in that direction. I suppose what I mean by that is to make it darker, I think there's a temptation with musicals to turn them... They almost inevitably become lighter and more festive and singing, all singing, all dancing. And I wanted it to have its fantastic musical element, but also to, just to honour the fact that this is Graham Greene and it's a dark, bittersweet, troubled world, world view. And it's also a piece about what it means to decide to age and how people age. I mean, that's yeah. quite serious. Because he, quite he profound, didn't yeah. talk about it as a comedy, did he? He said no. that it's, a, it's a, a novel with amusing bits. Or, yes, that's know. right. I think, I think he, he did... He uses the word an entertainment. I think he does see it as being entertaining. And Augusta is a very entertaining character. But it is profound. It's, it's got uh, a, quite a, a, an interesting message, I think, about... Um, about survival and living life to the full and not giving in and not mm. giving up. Mm. And that's very good for a musical. That suits the musical form, I think, because it's very aspirational. Um, and it suits the sort of great, strong, stirring an anthems. But um, I, I, I did want to do quite a bit of work. But the good news is that by doing all that work, and I, I spent a, a lot of time with the writers last summer, um, the writers, I have to say... Um, Anthony has a, has a very delightful house in the south of France. So <laughs> that's why I felt it was very important we all got together to work on this piece. So This is a key yeah, piece of advice, yeah. any of you. Yeah, I think if he'd lived in South London, I wouldn't have been so fussed, really. But um, anyway, so we, we got together in the south of France and we had actually, we did really focus. And we did, I think that was the most important time. We, we did some really good radical work on, on it then. And that was very rewarding because they're so talented and you could, you could steer them in another direction and they'd go off and write a new song and come back and go, great, great, fabulous. Um, so that was, that was very good. And then in the autumn, we did a, a, a week of workshop on it where we had a, a sort of a cast of just very talented people who weren't necessarily right for the parts, weren't going to play the parts, but just could come in and give us a really good reading and a good, a good musical rendition of it and we could judge it and think about it and look at it again afresh and and is all this really all exciting when it's a new work or do, is there a moment at which you think oh my god I wish I was doing the seagull again yeah, because uh, I know where all the bits go uh, no I suppose so you don't know what you've got really do you it's a bit no. of you're 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 working a bit in the dark um and, was, it, yeah. and what happens if you know, did you sometimes hear something and think, 
God, that's not how I saw that song at all and that emotional moment at all. Yes. You know, and what do you do then? Do you change it? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I think We're I, getting a very good view of this. <laughs> yeah, I, think, yeah. yes. I think you do. I think I, th- I tried to be really honest with the writers. So th- I thought the last thing they need is someone being sycophantic and telling them all how clever they are. So I thought I would be really honest if anything bothered me. Sometimes you have a a solution to the problem. You say, I, I know what it, I know it, it should go more like this. But more often than not, you just say, there's a problem here. There. Could you go away and think about it? And they were really good at doing that and then solving the problem. Mm. And they were very trusting because when you write something, it's your baby, isn't it? It's, you're so close to it and so mm. attached to it. And occasionally I had to say, I just know that whole song should be cut. I'm really sorry. It's a lovely song. I love it, but it's got to go. And they were very good at going, right, OK. There were a few tense moments when they yes. looked at right, me. Right, yeah. OK. Uh, but, <laughs> but then they, they were always very good at sort of gritting their teeth and yeah. doing it. Yeah. It's um, a wonderful set. Um, and I, I'm not sure I've ever seen a band in a station. In the signal you know, box. In the signal box before. Yeah. Um, it's set very specifically in 1969 when Gr- Green set the novel and when the novel came out. Yes. Did you have to make decisions about how much you made that clear or did you feel that the whole sense of the design was travel takes you everywhere and you're kind of out of time? Because yeah. I thought that was really cleverly done. I was, I was very conscious that one of the things that makes this piece special and unusual is the fact that it's set in 1969. Mm. Because somehow you associate Graham Greene with an earlier period. Mm. And I think people coming to see it probably expect it to be set in the 40s yes. or something. And... Um, and the fact that there's a hippie in it and people take drugs and it's all about, you know, there's a lot of 60s references. I thought that was really exciting and unexpected and I think it is, in a way, Graham Greene letting his hair down and trying, as an, quite an elderly writer, to, to connect with the younger generation. Um, and, in, and now that we're 50 years on or whatever we are, it, there's a sort of charm in that, uh, period charm, which is interesting. But... Um, I, so I really was keen that the costume design honoured that period and wasn't vague. I wanted it to be very specifically 60s, um, which, of course, is quite a stylish mm. era as well. It's, <laughs> now that we look back on it, we think, gosh, you know, it, it, the, the, that, the silhouette of the dresses of that time, and um, it, it's all rather sharp and chic, um, and I like that. And I like the fact also, though, that it dealt with... Um, world travel because we we go it's great for a musical because we go all over Mm. the world and Mm. we engage with all sorts of different cultures and so the musical range is very wide it's not all 60s music it's Mm. every kind of music really and um and and i wanted the the i wanted to i i didn't want a set that was too complicated i i had a fear of because it because we go around the world and we visit everywhere I didn't want it to be, when we get to Istanbul, a great big Istanbul yes. set, get trundles on. You know. I thought it was better that we, we simply we, we move a bench, we change the lighting, and we're in Istanbul. Um, we have our departure board up there. You can really see it, but it tells you where you're going. I have a sort of... I don't know if you feel the same way as I do, but I, I think there's a wonderful romance about st- station platforms and departure boards, and when you go on the continent and you see all those places, you, could, you just want to get on all the trains, don't you? And I, I, I wanted to have a set which could sometimes look quite um, glamorous and seductive and at other times be quite harsh and basic and uh, a little bit mucky around the edges because I think that's very true to the spirit of the book that Mm. at times Henry, the main character, is swept up in the the excitement of travel by Augusta but at other times he thinks, I I just want to be home. I I feel out of my element. I want to be back in, um, in my back garden tending my dahlias. That's his big passion. Hmm. With, um, you know, different directors obviously encourage their actors in different sorts of way to research. Are you a director who says to your company when they sit there in the room for the first time looking at each other, go away and read the book or go away and do some research into this, that and the other? Or do you leave them as individuals to decide how they prepare for you? I sort of like them to feel free to do their own thing in a way, not to feel that I'm trying to sort of regiment them too much. I mean, there's reg- I regiment them in terms of how we actually perform the piece, and I'm quite specific about what I want them to do in a scene, I think. Uh, I, I mean, I, I like them to experiment and try different things, and 
but I, I'm quite, I, think, I hope I'm quite clear with them about what, what I like and what I don't like about what they're doing, so they know where they are. But I think in terms of their preparation, some actors like to learn the whole script in advance and some don't, and I think I can accommodate both. And you don't ask them to arrive off the book no, on day I love one? No, I love it when they, <laughs> when they do, but I don't want to prescribe that, really. I, I, I want them to feel that if that doesn't quite work for them... That's fine, but although I'm clear that... They, I always give them a date by which I want the lines to be learned. Uh, because really, until they learn the lines, I, I can't quite get in there to help them. Um, because they're just... It's a memory test up to them. Is there a danger, if they have learnt it all before they come, that they fix their character almost floating in space without any reference to anyone else? Well, it's harder to pull them back. This is a bit of a myth, I think. And I find that sometimes actors say that that's the problem. I, in my experience, I find it's the opposite, actually, that if they arrive knowing the script, they're free right. and they're confident. I think actors are understandably very nervous about lines and their memories, and if they feel that they have learnt it, they can do anything you want, anything you ask them. They're, they're able to take the note on board and, and they can run with it. And I had a wonderful experience a few years ago of directing David Haig, who was very popular here, I know, in The Madness of George III, mm-hmm. which in fact we brought to the theatre over the road. Um, and he arrived word perfect on day one. Um, he mm-hmm. sat for the read-through with the script because he didn't want the other actors to feel oh. uh, that they were at a loss, so that was, which is typical of David. Yeah. Um, but in fact, he did know the whole thing word for word, and that was just the most marvellous experience for me. It was really the most incredible thing directing him. I absolutely loved it. And one of the reasons I loved it was because he was so flexible. He, he, he felt very safe with the words, but, but he wasn't locked into an interpretation at all. Mm-hmm. And I, I felt I could suggest anything, and he just... From, I mean, partly because he's got great facility as an actor, mm-hmm. but also, I think, because he, at, at heart, he knew that he had the words under his belt. Um, but as for research, I, I did do a lot of research myself. This, this, one of the things that's a joy about directing is you get to learn a little bit about lots of different things. And this piece, for those who've seen it or those who are going to see it, um, you'll know that it's, um, it deals with so many different marvellous cultural references and um, historical references, geographical references, that I, there was so much to research and things that I knew nothing about that I was keen to find out about. And I, it was wonderful with the internet now because you can find mm. out a little bit about everything. And I, I got lots of stuff from the internet and printed it all off and put it all around the walls so that when the cast arrived on the first day, the rehearsal room was a bit like, a, <laughs> a bit like an exhibition, really. And I think that excited them they also we put up all the all the costume drawings and we put up maps of the world so they could trace the the journey that augusta and henry make and i think i thought that was important to to fire someone said to me once that the first day of rehearsal is all about firing their imagination Mm. and i think those who came to it probably a bit in the dark about what this was going to be like they went away that night eager to look up all this stuff and and i was very thrilled when i would see them in coffee breaks Peering at the wall, <laughs> reading it all, and yeah. I think I think we all enjoyed that side of the piece. Do you need longer um, for a musical in terms of preparing it, rehearsing it, and then previewing it than you do for a play, particularly a new musical? Yeah, I think so. I think you do. I mean, I thought this was very civilized the way this was all planned. We had five weeks rehearsal. We had then another whole week of what they call tech in the theatre, putting the show together technically. And then we have, we've had about nine previews. So I'm certainly not complaining about that. I thought that was very, very decent. Um, you always want more time. Of course you do. But it's Parkinson's law. I think if we did have more time, we probably wouldn't be more advanced, really. Um, I think there's a problem with a new musical, any musical, actually. If you make changes during the preview period, which you always want to do, uh, it takes a long time to change one little item because you have to get the sound, the music, the lighting, the band, the singers, every, there's so many elements that have to change. Mm. And you can't just, in a play, you can make very quick changes. Um, and sometimes that can be a bit frustrating. That's why I wanted to prepare it as thoroughly as I could so that the previews weren't um, a mad scramble. And I'm pleased to say that they haven't been a mad scramble. We, 
we we have made changes, but it's it's felt like we were it was comfortable. Yeah, you know. but but there there's a challenge, isn't there? Coming from a rehearsal room, yes. However much you've taped out the shape of the Minerva oh, yeah. on the floor, yeah. Yeah. Um, this is a very specific place, and the entrances are in quite odd places. They're never quite where you expect. You no, know, no. I mean, they they don't match. No, apart they from never do. No. So what? How do how do you cope with that when you bring them in the theatre for the first time? Do you have actors and dancers banging into each other. Yes. And it, 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 I mean, yeah, well, they do what they call a sort of spacing rehearsal for the dances because that could actually be quite dangerous. So you take time out when they just work with, without the band, even just, just quietly walking through the routines. Seeing how, how big a stretch yeah, they've got. Yeah. yeah, and I must say I felt what I often feel when the actors first move into the space that the, the show you've created in the rehearsal room rather evaporates on you and they look like a lot of rather lost souls with a, a lot of costumes and a lot of props and um, they, look, they look a little bit at, at a loss and I think it took us a week or so in the tech to reclaim what we had because the last run through we did in the rehearsal room was, was really good I think, yeah. we're really <laughs> confident and then they lost all their confidence yeah, yeah. so we've battled to get that back again Do you think that um the way that the show has come out now. And if, I know you open tomorrow, but yeah. it's felt, I think, for those of us who've seen it, it's felt incredibly ready. I think I saw the first preview. First preview it didn't yes. feel like a first preview Good. at all. Good. Um, is it the show that you thought it was going to be? I think it is in a funny kind of way, actually. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. I, because I suppose you are trying all the way through to chisel away at it till you end up with what you first had in your mind and of course the different collaborators bring their own bits of magic to it so there are things that I think well that's that's even more delicious than I thought it could be but the, yeah I think pretty much it, 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 it I, I like to think that it is quite true to the novel but it but it also does stand on its own two feet as a new piece of work for the theatre I mean I'm sure Graham Greene would be quite astonished and, <laughs> and slightly alarmed at the idea of turning this into a musical. I, 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 I don't know whether it's something that he would have... I mean, his, his, the estate, his, his family are very excited about it and they've all said yes, yeah. but whether he himself would have it, He was known for being rather... It. What was he called? Grim Glum? Yeah, Grim, that's wrong, <laughs> yeah, something like that. And I think that um, uh, he might have been a bit surprised, but I... So I, I was always quite keen to create something that I felt if he were to walk in the door now uh, I'm talking theoretically but you know obviously it could never happen but if he were to to come in hypothetically um, uh, he would uh, he would recognize it as the piece he wrote um, and not think that we'd sort of made a travesty of it I Mm. I was very nervous some of the characters in it Henry particularly the leading man is not a character you naturally would think of in a musical comedy. No. Someone who sort of does a tap dance. So I was very keen that he didn't... We didn't get into that. We didn't ever see Henry looking daft in the wrong way. Um, Augusta, I thought, could be a, could be a musical character because she's so extravagant and flamboyant. Um, and, sh- and maybe he would like it because he's not known for his women, Graham Greene, in no. terms of writing women, no. except this character. This character it, yeah. It's a rare central character for Greene, who's a woman. Yeah, that, that's right. I agree with you. That's a very good point. I think, he would prob- I think he probably was a bit in love with Augusta, and I think he would love to see her being portrayed in this glamorous way. Um, I hope he would. But, no, it has, it has worked out as I like. There are always things that you want to develop. You never feel you've sort of finished, and I know I'll come back in a couple of weeks' time and think... Ooh, I've got to sort that out. We, you know, I cannot watch it without giving loads of notes uh, and certainly taking loads of notes. But, um, no, in, in, in essence, I'm really thrilled with the, what everyone's come up with. And on the first night, tomorrow night, when you're sitting, will you be sitting in here? Yes, I do, yes. And, and what's that like? <laughs> well, because, How do you feel? because I used to be an actor, it's a hell of a lot better than being in it. I think... <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, is it? You it is. think it'd be it the is. opposite. Uh, well, you can't... D- no, it doesn't really worry me. A lot of directors say, oh, it's horrible. First time, oh, I couldn't sit and watch it. I have to sit outside in the bar. I, I couldn't bed. I have to be in here. Wit- I'd love to- I have to witness it, for better or worse. I've got to witness what they do. But, um, no, I think that it's very... It is nerve-wracking, but I find it perhaps more exciting than scary, if I'm honest. Um, and do you think that is because you're an actor? So you yes. know that it's about the alchemy and it... Yeah, yeah. and I think that when things go a little bit wrong, 
that actually the actors get very worried about that, but the audience don't mind. They know that we're all human and things do go wrong, and, and as long as the spirit is there. So that's what I always try and say to them, just have fun with it. Don't, don't mm. get obsessed by every last detail. And I know when I was an actor, I did used to worry far too much and get far too nervous. But I did used to find performing really very scary. And I think setting, out, setting foot on stage on a first night is a very, very scary thing to do. And, and, it, and um, I, I feel that I'm very privileged to sit in the audience and just enjoy the work as mm. you're enjoying it. I can sit and watch it and then run round afterwards and change a few things. <laughs> <laughs> I think you must be a very lovely director to... Well, because well, well, you're so upbeat about it and Good. happy and celebratory yeah. about it. Because it is true, there's a long tradition here of Chichester of, you know, the, in the old days and yes. people will know some of these people of certain directors who really were at the bar and they were at the bar in the 70s. You know, yes. they weren't just standing at the bar. No. You know, they were under the bar. Yes. You know? <laughs> and there was a particular front of house person whose job it was to keep certain <laughs> directors up. Really? You know, yeah. Gosh. You know, we Which we could reinvigorate. Later, yeah. um, <laughs> yes, I, I'd like to introduce you. No, don't. Um, final question before we just yes. go out for a few from, from yes. the audience. Um, we're not going to talk about uh, Love's Labours and Much Ado Now, because we no. will be doing that. Um, but you, of course, did just do, again, very kindly for the theatre, a Shakespeare Day. And it has been the birthday and the 400 celebrations. And you did, of course, start your career as an actor with the RSC. Yeah. Do you find the balance between the different shows that you've done, so Nell Gwynn, of course, incredibly successful Rocky Horror tour all over the world, the different shows, is that for you as a director one of the things that keeps you excited and fresh, the, the enormous difference of the yeah. work that you do? Yeah, absolutely. I'm really very, very lucky because I get to do such a range. And I love the fact that I go from Rocky Horror to Shakespeare and backwards and... Nell Gwynn was great because I, the one thing I think I hadn't really had the chance to tackle was new writing. And suddenly this year, Nell Gwynn, brand new play. At the, we did it at the Globe and then it went into the West End. And then this piece here. So that's been really great. But, but Nell Gwynn couldn't be more different from this. Mm. And the Shakespeare's couldn't be more different from this. And Rocky just... Trun Rocky, I'm very fortunate. Rocky Horror came into my life in the most unexpected way, and the last thing I ever expected to get offered. But again, it felt like something... I, I didn't, I'd never seen it. I, didn't, I think I knew a couple of the songs when I was offered it. This was ten years ago. And I thought that I should dare to do a rock musical because mm. I'd never thought I would ever do a rock musical. It wasn't my thing. And I grew to absolutely love it. And I learnt a lot about putting on a musical because mm. I hadn't really done a... a, a well, I had hardly done a musical before then. And um, so it was a very instructive thing. And it, because it's very popular and uh, has this sort of cult following, it's just, it runs and runs. And we, I've now been doing it for 10 years and it's been all over the place. So, mm. And it's running even as we speak in, where are we tonight? Uh, we're in <laughs> Nottingham tonight. Um, and I, you know, I, I, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's also a family. I love the fact that the people who go to see it go back again and again. And I know a lot of the audience and they're amazing. So it's a, that has its own... No wonder job. that you like train stations. Quite. When spent, you look at spent, that tour. Yes, in fact, actually, funnily enough, the inspiration for this set was Nottingham train station because I went to see a show, it probably <laughs> was Rocky Horror, a, a few years ago. And um, I was on... So it was dusk, and I was just getting on a train back to London. And Nottingham station is very beautiful Victorian red brick uh, building. Uh, it's gorgeous. Gorgeous in a certain light, a bit like hmm. this set, but like magical. Other light, a bit, yeah. <laughs> but um, but there was it, oddly enough, there was it wasn't really a waiting room, but it was like a wait. It was like a waiting room on the platform I was on, a sort of, of just a room on the platform, and there was a brass band playing in it. And I don't know to this day what they were doing. I, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe maybe that's where they rehearsed. But they, <laughs> but it was it was just a very odd, surreal set. I thought I wish I could have. I wish I could, I could draw, because I would love to have yeah. captured it, you know. And, um, and, and they were just playing away, a brass band, in, in a waiting room very like, very like that. And I thought it was a sort of magical sight, and it's always stayed with me as the image I wanted for this show. Yeah, and I told the designer about it. And we just both love stations. Um, and then so, ten yeah. years on, here, ten it, years is, on, here it is. We yeah. Did. Yeah. Now, we've got time for a few questions. Could we have the house lights up a little bit? Um, does anybody want to ask a question? Gentlemen there, thank you. Um, just uh, setting it in 1969. Yes. That was a transitional 
times, and the Paris riots and Father Meinhof and Vietnam riots and goodness knows what else. Is, do you bring any of that to the production of this transitional time? Yes, a question about about the very specific time of sixty nine and, and and we do bring that to it because the, there's the character of Thule, who is this um, young American student who um, uh, represents a lot of that she she 's a very free spirit she 's a hippie, and not at all what you expect from a Graham Greene character and um, she 's quite high focus in this version of the piece um, and uh, and has much more to do than she actually does in the novel, which is really lovely, I think. And, and she's a significant part of the novel, but n- not as much as this. And, um, and I think the clash of Henry, who is really a, a very old-fashioned kind of man, he's, he's sort of his... He hasn't really changed since the 40s, coming up against Tooley. That's, I feel that's the, that uh, encapsulates the excitement and the um, sense of change at that time. Yeah. Um, and we did, a, we did, I mean, there are lines in the piece about all that, so, some of those things you're talking about, and, and also we as a group did a bit of research into that and certainly tried to learn the basics of what was going on at that time. It's a very important year, yeah. Thank you. Another question. Edward. Um, you've had the rare opportunity of working with the same material, both as a stage play and as a musical, and I wondered if the musical form had allowed you to explore anything which you... Handling it to do as a, as a straight drama. Um, yes, exploring it as a musical. Yeah, I, I think it did. I think it. I felt. I think it's a very tricky piece. Actually, travels of my own as a novel. I think it's a flawed work. Personally, I have to say, and in it, and it has great strengths, and then other things that are just very, very curious. And it's a very odd book. Um, and I think that I felt when it was adapted as the play, there were some things in it that I always wrestled with, and doing it again has given me a chance to revisit them and perhaps find a way of clarifying stuff. And, and I, I, I don't know if you agree with me, but I find, I find adaptations of novels very problematic on stage. I, mm. I've seen a lot of novels on stage where I've thought, oh, why don't we just go and read the book? You know, why, why are we trying to make this... If, if Jane Austen wanted... Um, Pride and Prejudice to be a play. She'd have written a play. She wrote a novel. Let's read the novel. Um, I, and and if it becomes just a mad scamper through the story to get to the end in two and a half hours, then I'm not really interested. Because after all, we don't read novels like that actually for the plot. We read. I don't. I, I, I read it. It was a little bit for the plot, but but I'm a lot of the delight of a Jane Austen novel is the wit and the and the narration and and her particular taste and all those things. So. And the characters, just the, the characters. So I want, to, I want to hear her voice. And I felt with this that there, were, there are episodes in the novel that I think can all go and be simplified. And the, the writers very much agree with me. And they had done a lot of simplifying. But there were still um, parts of it that I just thought, that, that's, that can all go. We can streamline this more. And I like to think that that's one of the successes of the piece. If, the, mm. if it is, if there is a success, I don't know whether it's. I don't. You know, you just work away and you do your best. But one of the things I th- I feel pleased about is that we have rationalised it um, and not been mm. too slavish about putting every last bit of Graham Greene on screen. Because I think for those who want every bit of Graham Greene, they should go and read the book. Mm. You know, Greg. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, you, you mentioned uh, uh, a number of things you've done over the past year. I wonder whether you could uh, share any information with us about how much it costs to bring a new musical. Oh. <laughs> I'm afraid I don't know. I, I, I really don't He's know. far too grand to know about that. <laughs> a, 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 I don't know, and B, if I did know, I probably shouldn't say. Uh, I, I don't know about the. Uh, you mean financial? Co- you mean. Does it cost millions? Oh, right. Oh, right. No, I don't think it costs millions, no. No, no. Um, but it costs many thousand. And I. I don't know how many. I, 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 I try to re- remain a little bit r- removed from all that because I, I don't like the responsibility of being... Of, I, I wouldn't sleep at night, you know, and in a way that isn't my... That's not my job. I'm, I mean, I, I'm aware... They tell me when elements of it are going over budget and I'm, I, th- I hope I'm quite good at saying, OK, fine, well, w- then we'll have to cut something and we do, you know, and I, I don't want to go over the budget. But I, I, I think that the budget for a show like this at Chichester is um, very 
fair and decent, and you have to have certain per- parameters for t- putting on a show. And I didn't want it to be a big razzmatazz spectacular. I wanted it to be simple. The I wanted to tell the story as simply and economically as possible. And that went down very well with the management. Um, (laughs) I mean, I I think it is a good moment because we're going to need to draw it to a close because there is actually going to be a band rehearsal. There is. Uh, Possibly not in there, maybe down here. Um, But I think it is is worth saying that one of the things that, for those of you who have not yet seen it and those of you who have, I'm sure will agree, that it's a terrific cast across the board. We've mentioned Mm. Patricia Hodge, uh, particularly as as Aunt Augusta, but the ensemble is incredibly good. The dancing is incredibly good. And the way that actually you give the sense of actually a big musical in some of those numbers, um, when actually there are sometimes only three dancers and singers, is really something. And and I I think that is worth saying, that that is what you can do here in the Minerva. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm, they're a particularly talented group. And there are people playing in the ensemble who normally play leading roles. I mean, there's a wonderful actress called Sarah Earnshaw who played the Lady, in, Lady of the Lake in my production of Spamalot, which is a fantastic show-off, um, virtuoso part in a big, splashy West End musical. And, and here she is in the ensemble being brilliant. But we have that sort of strength in the cast. And and I think that really has helped us. They're, they're, they, they don't put a foot wrong. They really don't. They're great. And Stephen Pacey, who plays opposite Patricia, is one of my favourite actors of all time. And I've worked with him loads as an actor and as a director on stage and on the radio and all sorts. And I was so pleased when he said he'd do it because he did the workshop, actually, in the autumn. Mm-hmm. And um, there, it was very clear from his performance in that that no one else should play this part. He, it, it's tailor-made for him. Or it could have been. I mean, it wasn't written with him in mind, but it felt like it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's just brilliant, I think. But you said just a moment ago that you weren't sure what, how it was going to be received. I think... I think it's going to be received in a very happy way Touch tomorrow wood, night. But it's incredibly kind of you to come before it's even opened and do this. Oh, it's a pleasure. Uh, for, Great for the theatre. Um, the, the post show will be on the 5th of May, um, and it's the usual deal. Anybody can come, um, but you do need a ticket, and it's free. But you just come at the end of the performance and, and come on in. And then Patricia Hodge is doing a special lunch on the 27th of May, uh, where she'll be talking about her career, this show, but her career in general terms. And, of course, she has a very long history. Uh, history with uh, Chichester. Um, I will be back again on Friday uh, doing the pre-performance for Enemy of the People, which is previewing over the way. Um, But for now, we must give the stage back to the band and to the players. But can I ask you to thank the wonderful Christopher Luscombe and such good luck for tomorrow night. You don't need it, but we are all rooting for you. Chris Luscombe. Thank you.